having the, let's say, reliable value of IC is very important. And then PNP and PNP are the same. So I want to have a well-defined IC. I want to set it to whatever I like. And I don't want it to change with whatever parameter that is not under my control. If beta of the transistor changes, I don't want IC to change that. If the temperature changes, I want to have more or less the same IC, right? So the stability of IC is very important to me. And then the other parameter that is important, and we saw that uh, you know, if you push these devices too far, you can't enter saturation. And one indication of saturation is that your collector meter voltage drops to about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 volts if you're in deep saturation, maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.6 if you want to avoid deep saturation, right? So there is a limit on how much the voltage on the collector and the meter terminals can vary, right? That's another parameter for my bias. Uh, another bias parameter, right? I want to make sure that I have enough VCE at DC that when an AC signal comes and starts playing with that collector voltage, my device stays in active region. So that's called the voltage swing. So I want to set IC because I want to have all my small signal parameters uh, well defined and stable and then as I like them. And I want to have a no demand of VC. Sometimes we go for maximum swing. Maximum swing means that the signal at this, let's say, collector or meter is changing as much as it possibly can before you transition into cut off or saturation. Sometimes you don't want maximum swing. You have a chain of three amplifiers, each one has a gain of 100. There is no reason that the first amplifier is designed for maximum swing because the signal over there at the output of the first amplifier is still tiny. The signal at the output of the second amplifier is still tiny as well. So instead of designing for maximum swing, you go and look at other parameters that are important to you, like noise. Maybe design for noise or, or power consumption. If you have nothing else to do, reduce the amount of power you use. Okay? So biasing means setting IC and DC to whatever you want. We looked at a couple of different ways of doing it. Again, I'm showing you NPN circuits, PMP is exactly the same. But just pay attention to the directions of currents and diodes and you're good. Uh, so we said there's this basic method where you essentially set the base current through this line E, right? And so this line E, if your emitter is grounded, this line E is going to be VCC minus VVE over RP. And by choosing RC and all, you know, all these other parameters, you can get whatever bias that you want. We didn't like this that much because IC, which is beta IME, it's going to depend on beta. Right? So as your beta changes because of the temperature, or you're changing the bias point of the device, or you're switching from one direction to another, beta is going to vary. And even devices of the same family, same part number, can have different beta. Uh, so for any, whichever device that you put in this circuit, you're going to have a slightly different behavior from it. We don't like it that much, but if you're using the known transistor and if you're making only one or two circuits, this is okay. Right? You design it, you calibrate it, you're done. But in general, we don't like that dependence on beta. Then the alternative to this was to have a voltage divider at the base, which is a terrible idea. We don't do that, I'm not going to even mention it again. And we said our most reliable, or let's say our go-to biasing technique is a technique or a circuit called, or known as each biasing, where I add the resistor to the meter terminal here. Right? And this is called H biasing because the, this combination of these three biasing resistors is like an H. RB1, RB2, and RB3. Uh, let's assume the device is not saturated. Right? So let's assume you know, RC is small enough or it's the collector is directly connected to VCC. So we don't have a saturation issue. 
analysis of this circuit is simple, right? So what we do is take it from here, come up with the definite equivalent. This is the my, my preferred method. What you can do is that you can write the KCL here. And start solving the KCL of the KCL. No problem, nothing wrong with that. What I'd like to do is that I'd like to see how the circuit works a little bit more clearly. So what I do is I come up with the definite equivalent circuit for RB1 and RB2, the left side. Right? I can do that because the left side, when I, you know, it's only connected to one branch, one uh, uh, wire over there. To the left, everything is linear. Remember Tavern and Norton, those kinds of theorems or tricks we used? They were mm -hmm. only applicable to linear circuits. So I can take the left side, it's a linear circuit, and replace it with its Tavern equivalent circuit, and then put, you know, put the rest of it back. I'm just going to get rid of RC, just as soon as we go RC. No, you uh, can't have RC, but no saturation. This is a similar situation. And then this is easy uh, in terms of you know, how to find these values. RTH, the seven resistance, is the parallel combination of RB1 and RB2. Why? Well, you uh, remove all the independent sources from your circuit, so VCC is now zero volts grounded, and you look back, and what you have is RB1 and RB2 in parallel. Right? So that's easy. And then B tablet is your open circuit voltage. If I remove the transistor on the right side, the open circuit voltage is the voltage of the cross this resistor, which is the voltage divided between RB1 and RB2. And then I have this coming circuit. Okay? And by now, I'm hoping that you don't need to think to solve this problem. Right? So all I need to do is to write a single KDL. And we use constant voltage drop models. This is our preferred model for hand calculations. Right? You have one equation, one unknown. Why? Because IB and IB are related, you know, IB, or IB is beta plus one times IB. That's the norm. And BB is about 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts, depending on the transistor you use, let's say 0 0.7. So this is 0 0.7, this is beta plus one IB, I have one equation, uh, one unknown, solve it, you get your IB, and therefore your IC. Okay? So, uh, if we do that, let me just find it. Or, or maybe you can just. Uh, IB is going to be B7 minus VBE divided by R7 plus beta plus 1 RE. And I see that for is beta times this. Whoa. I've got an interview for that. What? Is that nine wins? Okay. And so you may ask, you know, it's the same thing as we had before. You know, the, the IC that I have here is now again a function of uh, beta, not changing. It, it is, but not as constant. And that, that's not right. So if, if I rewrite this equation, I can write it as IC is B tablet minus BBE. <laughs> that number is more or less constant, right? Because BB doesn't change much, even if you switch it less. Divided by R E Okay, so what I did is that I divided the denominator here by beta, beta plus one per beta is almost one. 
there. So, so that's one. Yeah. Does R E divide by alpha? Mm -hmm. Sorry? Isn't R E divided by alpha? Yeah, but then this thing alpha is one. Oh. Okay. So it's just a, that's why it is approximately that much. Okay. So it's R E plus R definitely divided by beta. If you want to reduce the sensitivity of your device to, to beta, but if you're really pushing for it, make sure RE is much bigger than this. And then the device is not going to respond to changes in beta. But even if they are compared, right? I mean, let's say your RE is 1K, your R terminal is 100K, beta is 100. Let's say if these two terms are com comparable, you still have much less sensitivity to variations in beta. If beta goes from 50 to 200, the denominator here changes from 1.5 to 2.5 instead of a direct relationship with beta. So instead of having a factor of four difference in your IC, you have a much smaller range. So this is going to be much more stable in terms of IC value. And uh, I asked you to ask me a question the next time we meet each other. What was that question I asked you to ask me? Was your ring break? How does that water resistor make life so much easier? Okay, good, good. So, now, anybody thought about that? No. Great. Make the flow destroy. You know, all of that magic comes from that little line. So, this is the math. This is the equation. Who cares? Right? Okay. Uh, all of the magic is happening here. So let's assume I'm modeling all the chains. So let's assume I set this to some BV and this some IV coming in. From my bar second, I already know what I have, but I, I want to focus on RE, right? A couple of things can happen. Let's say, let, let's say if I don't have RE at the beginning, let's say, I didn't have RE, I decided to use the fixed VD to set my IC. Because I know IC is IS into the VDE over VT. Or I use the fixed ID to set IC, which is another layer box. You know, one of those two techniques. Both of them are really dumb. Right? I'm not going to do that. Because the first technique, if I set the voltage, to a fixed value, I don't like my transistor. Because as soon as I set that voltage to whatever I want, I establish the current, the transistor is going to warm up. When the transistor warms up, IS goes up, you will have more current through your transistor. Oh, it's a positive and then, yeah, you have a positive feedback. <laughs> so unless something external limits the amount of power dissipated on your transistor, you're going to move towards self, basically, destruction. Right? The transistor gets hotter, the IC goes up, it gets more hot, more hot, more hot, and then it's destroyed. It's destroyed. So that is a terrible thing. I never fix a voltage across a dial. Right? Unless I don't like Second way, oh, forward bias. Reverse bias I actually do that a lot. Forward bias, I never fix the voltage across a dial. Uh, second method, by fixing the current IB, that's another biasing technique, right? I can use a current source, a fixed current source in the base, and then push a current into the base. But then my IC will depend directly on beta. And if beta varies by 20%, 50%, 100%, 100%, my IC is changing by the same amount. So these two techniques are not good. The second one is not going to kill your transistor, but it's a bad way of designing it, especially if you're going to have made a lot of the circuit, and many, many circuits, or you want to have a circuit that works under very different conditions. Second one is not too bad. First one definitely is a normal. OK, so I had a, a small transistor here. A, a small resistor, I call. And let's see what this little guy does. So in, you know what? Let me show you the feedback thing again first. So in the case of biasing, let's say, the BB case, in this case, I get some IC, I get some VE, that gives me a desired IC, but as soon as you get this, 
temperature goes up. When the temperature goes up, IS goes up. When IS goes up, IC goes up. When IC goes up, temperature goes even higher. Until you de destroy your device. Okay? Now, if I add my little resistor down here, let's see what happens. And I'm biasing in the worst possible way by putting the PV on the base. So if you do that with some PV, you get the desired IC, right? You go and do the calculation. You know, I, I use that equation. You figure that you know if I want to have an IC of one million PV, it should be 0.55, and you go and calculate how much R E or how much PV will give you that. Okay. All good? As soon as you turn this device on, this circuit on, your temperature will go up. Okay. You have some ICPC across the device. Okay, temperature goes up. What happens next? IS goes up. IS goes up. IC goes up. IC goes up. Each means each. What happens to IC after that? IC goes up. What happens here? In this circuit, when you look at this IC, has gone up. What happens? It goes up. Hmm? The voltage across it. Would voltage across this guy goes up. Yeah. So VE goes up. Right? VE goes up, what does that mean? It means VVE. Goes down. Right? Your base is fixed, your emitter has gone up. So this pushes IC down. Right? You have implemented negative feedback. That little resistor will take care of it. So if IC wants to go up, and then using the example of temperature here, but beta does the same thing. If beta of your device goes up for whatever reason, IC wants to go up, but then that resistor will stop. Push it back to, or moves it back closer to where it was before. This is a bit uh, freely changed, right? So this is producing some negative feedback that helps you. Then we'll see another one instance of that soon. But uh, anyway, so the magic of this H bias network is partially because of this type of thing. It's taking care of the radiation to a great extent. Now. For, in terms of designing the HYS network, we mentioned uh, how we do it, so let's just quickly go over that. It's been a couple of weeks. Okay, so how do we decide on designing, how do we design an HRS network? Step one, choose IC or determine IC or find IC. It's, even given, it's either given to you or, or you figure it out. You also need to find VC. Right? So again, if it's a maximum flame problem, you have one way of figuring out what VC is. If it is maximum gain, it's a different thing. But ICVC, this is your bias point parameters. Once you have them assigned somewhere between 0.1 to 0.5, you don't really need to go above 0.1 to BRE. This is BRE. If you do not have a lot of supply voltage to play with, if you're running this up a, I don't know, a one volt battery or one and a half volt battery, you want to be very careful with DC voltages, that's not for you. If your power supply is 10 volts and you have more than enough, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, right? So you choose that, and then once you do that, you have VE, you have RE, and you have E, right? Because 0.1 or 0.2 volts across RE 
sets you the sets the voltage at the emitter. You know IC, so RE is going to be VE divided by IC more or less, right? And VB is going to be half a volt, 0.6, 0.7 volts above that. So right away you have your RE. Now the question is how do I choose RB1 and RB2? So in the next stage, you also know IP by this time because you know your transistor and you know there's a data sheet, you have a rough idea about the beta for your device. So once you know your IP, you go and say choose RB1 and RB2. Such that these two conditions are met. VB is more or less uh, whatever that you want from the voltage divider. Right? So that's the voltage divider. So if, if, you're, if you want to use this equation, there is an assumption, there is an implied, uh, implied assumption that you're ignoring IP. Right? Because if you take IP into account, that voltage is not this much anymore. It's a little bit less. But I'm, if I'm ignoring IP, then that voltage is about this much. And then how can I ignore IP? If assuming or if or by setting IP to be much larger than IP. Right? How can I ignore IB if this current is much, much bigger than that? What is much, much bigger? Again, depends mostly on your power budget. So this is 5x to maybe 10x. The, the higher the better, but there are diminishing returns, right? So after that, you're wasting a lot of power here. That power is not doing anything other than setting the voltage for you. So you know, if you go to 100x, it's really no help. Okay, and this actually, this condition, and this one give you two equations that you need. So you choose, let's say, 5x for IBV to IB ratio. That means that VCC over RB1 plus RB2, this is almost equal to IBV, right? So you have this equation, which is N times IB, you choose N. And you have this equation from whatever you did about. And then you have all the values. You can determine how you want to be true to for our syndromes. Then you go. Okay. Um, we went through an example of solving an H wire. And I actually explained it uh, a moment ago how we do the analysis. Let's do an example and design one. So I use an, uh, let's say, PMP here. Same principle for bias network design. And this is an inverted H right? In the RE and RB2 at the top. So the question says um, design the bias network. for maximum swing. This is the VL. Assumption VDB is 0 0.7 volts. Beta is 100. VTC saturation is 0.2 volts. VCC is 6 volts. RC is 2 kilohertz. Okay. 
So we only have one resistor value and one power supply. We want to design the rest of this. Okay, so how do we go ahead. Maximum swing. What does maximum swing mean? It means that I want, if there is an AC signal coming in, if this is an amplifier, I want the out to change as much as possible. Without the transistor entering trial, sorry, not trial, saturation or power. Okay? So it has to be somewhere between the two limits. Remember, you know, you have the transfer, you know, the characteristic here for, for some circuits. You saw that at the beginning, for example, it was in cutoff, then active region, then saturation. You want to put it exactly in between those two limits. Okay, so how do we do this design? My VCC is large enough. Right? So 6 volts is, is a good amount of voltage. So let's assume that VRE that I choose is point two volts. And bridge. So I assign 0.2 volts across this time. Um, okay? So point two is a good number. Okay, so that's gonna be one limitation. Of all the power supply voltage that I have, all the six volts that I have, point three is already focused. Hmm? What else is going to limit my swing here at VR? Well, if IC goes to zero, I'm getting closer and closer to power, right? So IC goes to zero if the device is in active region. If IC goes to zero, I'm getting closer and closer to cutoff region. What is the voltage at the output as IC goes to zero? It's going to get closer and closer and closer to zero volts. So I'm going to have a limit at zero volts when IC is approaching zero. So at cutoff, I'll have the edge of cutoff, let's say. V out is zero because my C is zero. Okay? My C is zero. And therefore V out is zero. Okay. So that's one limit. But at the other hand, on the other hand, I already have 0.2 volts on the meter. V out, what is the maximum V out I can have before the device enters saturation? So 0.2 volts across RE. What is the maximum V out before the device enters saturation? Or edge of saturation? So I'm going to write edge of saturation. This is really edge of deep saturation, but really, let's just call it edge of saturation. Yeah, minus two, minus two, minus two, minus two, minus two. VC is how much? Six volts. Oh, VC. Oh, VC. Uh, VC is... Edge of saturation, how much is VC? So I push VC as high as it goes, and then after that it's deeply saturated, and my device... No, zero point two then. Because it's at maximum voltage. <laughs> 5.6? 5 5.6, 5 right? Because I have 0.2 volts across that RE, and I need to have about 0.2 for saturation, right? So VC max, or um, VCE is about 0.2. Mm -hmm. V out max? is, I just got from the top side, 6 volts for VCC, minus 0.2 volts for VRE, minus 0.2 volts for VCE side. VCC side. I mean, you know okay? So, so the collector voltage can go as high as 5.6 and as low as 0. If I want to have the maximum swing, meaning that the sinusoidal that is not distorted too much, uh, what should be the DC value, the average value of that sinusoidal? Halfway between those two, right? 
So half pay between 0 and 2.6, and sorry, 5.6 is? Uh, 5.6. Yeah, so This is where I put my VCQs without any signal. If it is sitting there, it can go down by 2.8 volts and I hit cut up. It can go up by 2.8 volts and I hit saturation. Let's try this again. Right. So this is the largest signal I can have. Peak value, peak to peak is 5.6. Peak value, so it, I can have a 2.8 volt sign surgical at the end. Average is 2.8, 9.5.6. Okay, so I figured out my V out at operating point. Great, because I know RC, I can figure out RC. Great, because I can now figure out RD. Saturation, can you assume the current at R well current at R is the same as, as the current at R C? No. Yeah. Saturation that assumption is uh, then not valid. Then how do you get the R E? Because you're using the R C. No, this is at the operating point. This is where my device is how I say it in between those points. So what's in between it's fine. Yeah, in between it's fine. Yeah, so because it is inactive. Yeah, okay. I didn't realize that. I haven't pushed it to saturation. In active region, I see an are more or less the same. Yeah, okay. okay, so I have 5.1 volts volt at base, and I need to figure out RB1 and RB2 such that I get that value. I can figure ID. ID is going to be 1.4 milliamps divided by beta. So that's uh, 14 microns. I choose my IDV to be 10 times that. Right? And now I can find RB1 and RB2. So V RA is just the chosen value to satisfy. VRE, yeah, it's a design issue. So you choose it to be modular that you like. Don't choose it to be large. Right? Because, for example, let's see, if I choose VRE to be 1, I'm eating into my swing. Because the swing is whatever VRE is plus VC saturation. If I put one volt for my VRE, my swing instead of 5.6 points peak to peak is going to be 4.8. Um, like for parking wise, for assessments. Yeah, so uh, yeah, the design questions are hard to mark, right? So I'm trying to avoid this situation like that. But. Uh, Use point okay. but, but if you have a single bad in point one, or you point, you know, you can do A point two is a good one. And also, is uh, much greater when you can find this five times? Five or two times. Five to twenty. Oh, okay. I don't go above twenty. Ten is the rule of thumb. Makes all the calculations easy. Five is still good. Did in your uh, last slide, man, did you mean a hundred I or ID? Is that a 10? No, it should be 10. It's 5 to 20, right? So ID is 14 microns. I assume ID to be 10 times ID. 
So IDD will be 140 microns. And then I have two equations to find RB1 and RB2. One is IDD is equal to PCC over RB1 plus RB2. And the other one is that DD is equal to RB3, uh, RB1 in this case, over RB1 plus RB2 PCC. So two equations, two unknowns, final values, I actually have the final values. Uh, RB2 is 6.4 kilos, and RB1 is 36.4. Now, once you're here, you're not done. Because now you know what resistor values you like, or you want to have. Uh, the problem is that you don't have the resistors that we like all the time. You have to go and look at what is available in your drawers from the supplier, whatever it is. So, for example, you don't have a 143 ohm resistor. You have 150 or 120. Right? So you have to choose one. Let's say if you want to stick with the closest value, you choose 150 for your RE. Right away, your uh, RIC will be a little bit smaller. Right? But then, and come here. So you don't have 36K and 6.4K. You have 6.8K and uh, let's say 39K or 33K. You have to pick from those values, right? So once you pick your values, this skill gets you close. But once you pick your values, you go and analyze the set. Yeah. Make sure that you get, you know, I see that it works what you want to do now. So for all the kind of standard resistor um, resistance values. Are they just random numbers or like how no, do no, they? No, no, no. How do they get? Yeah, let's no, no, no. So, okay. No, they're not random numbers. So, a good question. Yeah, so, right now, right now you have resistors, I think your typical tolerance is about 5%. Mm -hmm. Right? For your resistors. Just a decade or two ago, it was 10%. Right? So, whatever resistor you have bought, let's say 1 kilo resistor, it could be 1.1 or 900 grams. It's a tenth of a percent of it. So it could be somewhere in this range, right? So when they picked the first one, let's say R1, the next one was 20% higher. Uh, how do I say? 120% higher. This is R2. And then the next one is 120% R2. This is R3, right? Why? Because if you need it, let's say for whatever reason, an 1100 ohm resistor, it could be a 1K that is at the positive extreme or a 1.2K that is at the negative extreme. Left extreme or right extreme, right? So the gap between them is 20%. So the first value is, let's say for resistors for E12, is 1K, the next one is 1.2K, the next one should have been 1.44, and actually 1.5K. Good enough, right? Then 1.8 and it keeps going up. So they're, they're basically trying to account for the error in them by having it at like 120% instead of like 100% like having it like so, that. So they, yeah, so this issue, this way, you know, the idea is that if you have enough resistance, yeah, you have all the values. Yeah, okay, that's what it is. So there's a little bit of overlap between the ranges. Yeah, that's what it is. And you have the, uh, the needs. But there's a little bit of overlap between the ranges as well. Uh, with 5% uh, resistors, that, that those steps are closer to each other. So the first one is 1K, the next one is 1100, then 1200, and so on and so forth. Right? But that's the reason. So capacitors are, actually, especially the big capacitors, electrolyte capacitors are worse. The tolerances are 20%. So you see the first one is 1 microfarad, the next one you don't have 1.2. Nobody even bothers or 1.5, maybe the next one is actually even 2. Jump probably. But for resistors, E12 is this. 1, 1.2, 1.5, 1.8, and so on and so on. Right? But anyway, going back, after you do all this design, you have to go and pick your resistors from whatever that is available to you. Usually you don't go and insist on a resistor value too much. You are not going to go and say, I want a 143 ohm resistor. You can get a 143 ohm resistor, right? If you go and look at the 
resistor value that are, let's say, accurate to 0.1% is the 0.1% power, so and there are such resistors. You can buy them, but a 10% resistor or 5% resistor is cents, that resistor is probably a few dollars at the very least. So you pay a price. Is it worth it? Most of the time, no. Sometimes, yeah. Okay? So we are not too attached to the values we can do. Alright, so H Y C all done. We have to say that in the next video too. We're not too attached to the values that I can't do. Alright, just get some bread more for it. So get a breadboard for a resistor? No, oh. So let's look at self-biasing. This is another biasing technique. Uh, I really like this, but it's not that useful. It's just weird. And biasing circuit is RF with one component. Let's just analyze it to see how I generate IC and DC uh, that I want. That I want. I'm hoping for some IC and I need to get some predetermined DC, DCE. I read my KDL, you know that by now the DCC is equal to the curvature RC is IC, right? Plus IB. Plus the voltage up across the feedback resistor, call it RB, RF, IB, plus BB. Okay, so and uh, the again, one equation, I have everything I need to figure out. Uh, IC Let's just find ID first ID, this is a little So, by choosing, if I know my RC, because sometimes that's coming from your game or other considerations, right away I can figure out what is the RF I need to use to give me the IC that I need. And BCE is easily calculated as well. So BCE in this circuit is BC, the emitter terminal, the emitter uh, is grounded, and that's uh, basically BCC minus RC plus IB RC, or you can go up to RF, or you can say it is BBE plus RF. Here, if you go from top from BCC, you go down to find BT, or you go from the bottom up. Um, I'm just wondering, why do we not, for this biasing technique, why do we not need a resistor at the emitter terminal of the... Well, let's see that. Okay. Let's see that. Okay, so let's see why, why we, we are happy with just one resistor. Well, first of all, you can see that this is... Like the H wire thing, we have reduced sensitivity to beta, right? Because I can choose RC to be comparable to RF over beta or much bigger, you know, right? So therefore, variations in beta don't matter that much, uh, and variation in BE, they don't matter. That's what formula says, right? But let's see if we can figure out how the magic happens here. So let's say you've got your IC through 
some mechanics. You, you design it just with your eyes, what your RC is, chosen your RF, and, and you're happy. You turn on the circuit. You turn on the circuit, and let's say it heats up. Because it heats up, IS allows, let's say, temperature goes up. Temperature goes up, then your IS goes up. IS goes up, then IC goes up. Right? So far, it's all physics. What happens when IC goes up? IC goes up, then. Then IB then goes, down. goes down. Why? Because of the, the node there. Yeah, because when IC goes up, when this current increases, it pulls that VC voltage down. VC goes down, right? So if that happens, then VC goes down. If VC goes down, well, VC is what is supplying, let's say, IB, or you can say, I have slightly less voltage for VVE. If VC goes down, let me think about it in terms of IV. IV goes down, then IC goes down. So the mechanism that increased the IC is uh, opposed by the device itself. It doesn't want to move from where it is. So that, that's the definition of the stability, right? Mm -hmm. I want this thing to be where it is. I don't want it to move. If, if I push it, I would like it to come back. Same thing with beta. Same thing with beta. So if you set your IC and for whatever reason your beta increases. If beta increases, then IC increases. If IC increases, then your VC goes down, then your VVE goes down. So even if your beta increases, the device is going to use as maybe beta VVE to pull that IC to, to close to where it was before. Right? So it has that feedback mechanism again, but this time through that R. You can show that if I put an RE here, it's going to be even more stable, but you really don't need it. It's, it's an over. So this is another biasing technique that can give you whatever IC and DC that you need. It's unfortunately not as flexible as H biasing. So H biasing, we're going to talk about amplifiers today. Uh, what the, what the nice thing about cage biasing is that when we're going to talk about amplifiers, you'll see the signal is coming from the left side and then the output is taken out of the right side. They are separate. And between the input and output, I have a couple of bias here, but input is everything is happening here and then the output is happening there. Or if you want to think about the model that we had for the PJT, Right? This is the output circuit, this is the input circuit. They're only connected to a node. Right? So, makes my life easy. With that circuit, this RF that does all the nice things in terms of stabilizing the bias point for me, messes up that isolation. It is connecting the output of my circuit to the input of my circuit. Uh, it affects a whole bunch of AC parameters that uh, I usually use that from the circuit. For example, it affects the gain, it affects the input resistance, it affects the output resistance, all of this. You have one extra parameter that determines your gain. I don't want it. I want to have minimum number of parameters, most of the time. All right, so these are your two biasing techniques. We know them well, and let me see if there's anything missing on the biasing part. No, you're all good. Okay, so let's take a five minute break and then we continue.